Lord, thank you again so much for your love for us and that you have uh, brought us here today. I pray for um, Debbie, who has not been well, that you would just uh, touch her body and encourage her today. And, and we pray for healing on her behalf. And uh, I pray that you would uh, just encourage us today through your word. And pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, next week, uh, our missionary, Scott Johnson, will be speaking. And Wyatt will be leading the worship team. Yeah. So, for that. Well, have you heard the rage, the recent rage? If you're under the age of 18, maybe 25, you know what I'm talking about, right? It's the newest rage app out there. Can anybody tell me what it is? Pokemon Go. Pokemon Go, and you're a, he's 25 years old. Pokemon Go is the newest rage. I don't know if you're, you're if you're hep, I'll tell you. You got to be hep to know what that's all about, right? So, uh, on your phone, uh, it, it overlays Google Maps on your phone, and so there are poke. I hope I'm not going to ruin any kids by saying this. Not, 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 you already know about this, right? You know about that, right? No. You know? So you can use your phone to go to places, and there are Pokemon that you capture by going to that place onto your phone. And then once you get that Pokemon, then you can use it to fight other Pokemon with in battles, right? You've heard of that? Or, I mean, this is like 25 years old, but they've reinvented it with this new app. Well, guess what? New Life Bible Church is a Pokemon gym. serious? <laughs> <laughs> It means that the people who play this game, there are two places they can go in Twin Lakes to battle their Pokemon or exercise them or do whatever you do with the Pokemon. One is the fire department and the other is New Life Bible Church. Is God amazing or what? There, that's right. All you, all you need is the app. But people are going to come from all over Twin Lakes who would never come to this location because this app has designated our church as a gym. So they're all looking for Pokemon. So if you people, my, my kid was out to 1 o'clock this morning looking for Pokemon. My 20-year-old, he was out looking for Pokemon, walking around trying to capture his Pokemon. Um, <laughs> we caught a Jigglypuff out front this morning. Did you really? Yeah. Right out here? Right out there. <laughs> it's crazy. A Jigglypuff, it's a Pokemon. If you've never heard about it, it's, it's complicated. But there are, the people are looking for things, right? We're all looking. You know, this is an example where the illustration has overtaken the sermon. Yep. <laughs> People are looking for things, right? I mean, constantly. I'm, right now, the, the rage is for these teens, and who knows how long this will last, for these young people to be looking for Pokemon, and adults, to be looking for Pokemon. Um, but we're all looking for something, uh, you and I uh, included. And this morning, uh, we're, I'd like us to look at the life of Paul. We're one away. This is the second to the last sermon on the life of Paul. This is sermon number 39 on the life of Paul. And then after vacation will be sermon number 40, assuming that's not Father's Day. Father's Day is already over, right? Yeah, right. Yeah. I am telling you, I am out of it. He needs a vacation. I need a vacation. Hey, hey, I'm not. So let's look at Acts chapter 28, last chapter of the book of Acts, verses 1 through 16. And I titled this message, The Journey, uh, because the the journey uh, is, is it's what we're looking for. And, and you know, if, if uh, 
you were to ask people on the street what they're looking for, they're looking for a lot of things. They're looking for success. They're looking for money, riches. They're looking for love. They're looking for uh, acceptance. Right now, the Olympics are going on, so people are looking for the gold medal. What are you looking for in your life? What are you looking for? Well, let's look at the life of Paul and see what we can learn about life from this part in Paul's life. Verse 1 of Acts chapter 28, verses 1 through 16, it says, Now when they had escaped, now remember they had a big storm, Paul and his uh, disciples had been, or Paul and his fellow prisoners had been transported uh, from uh, Cyprus across the Mediterranean Sea all the way to this island and had gotten shipwrecked on their way to Rome to deliver Paul to appeal to Caesar. And so they had escaped from this shipwreck and they found that they were on the island of Malta. And I have a slide for Malta. This is the island of Malta. All right, so let's, let's get a little uh, high tech here. All right, so this is where they started out, Fair Havens, and then they were driven by a storm all the way over to here. It's like 45 miles an hour the whole way for 14 days, night and day through the storm. And so they ended up on this little island of Malta. All right? And the natives showed them great unusual kindness, for they kindled a fire and made us all welcome because of the rain that was falling because of the cold. So I have a slide picture of Malta. This is the island of Malta. Isn't that beautiful? Could you imagine what that would be like in a storm? It would not be good. And so Paul was, they mentioned this because they were impressed with how they were treated by these strangers, people they had never met before, uh, never, uh, maybe never see again, but uh, when they saw them coming out of the water, drenched, so carrying whatever, uh, floating, swimming, they, they built a fire, which was no easy task in a rainstorm, right? And they, they made it so that they would be warm and comfortable uh, because of the cold. And so Paul, again, was impressed by the kindness of these Maltese natives. So verse 3, we pick up and it says, When Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and laid them on the fire, a viper came out because of the heat and fastened on his hand. Is anybody afraid of snakes? No. <laughs> you might want to close your eyes for the next slide. You hear it? All right. That's the Natrix Natrix, and that's a, uh, a, it's called a grass snake, and it's poisonous. Um, they're not sure what the snake was because there are no poisonous snakes indigenous to Malta, at least that are there now. Um, so they don't know what the snake was, but could you imagine reaching in a, a, a bundle of sticks to throw it on the fire and all of a sudden you bring your hand out and there's gunk on your hand? Anybody having anxiety at this moment? So uh, if, it were, if it were me, I would be very upset. So when the, the natives saw the creature hanging from Paul's hand, they said to one another, No doubt this man is a murderer whom, though he has escaped the sea, yet justice does not allow to live. So, you know, they're, they're assuming that, you know, ancient uh, religions were that the gods were in charge, right? And they were kind of arbitrary. Sometimes they'd be nice and sometimes they'd be mean and, and they tended to make you pay for the wrong that you did. And, you know, it's what goes around comes around kind of theology. And so they figured that Paul had done some terrible thing and deserved to die. And so although he was saved from the sea, he was going to die in front of them because of the viper. But in verse 5 it says, He shook off the creature into the fire and suffered no harm. I, I, I just can't imagine myself just, hmm, shaking my hand and, and throwing the snake into the fire. Uh, and he suffered no harm. So in verse 6, however, they were expecting that he would swell up or suddenly fall down dead. But after they had looked for a long time and saw no harm come to him, they changed their minds and said that he was a god. Logical conclusion, right? <laughs> well, it is if you're from Malta, you know, because the gods would come down in human form and, and they were immortal, so you couldn't kill them. So they, uh, uh, a snake bite wouldn't have caused a god any problem. But this isn't the first time Paul had been confused. Uh, for being a god when he was uh, in Thessalonica, or was it Thessalonica? I don't think it was Thessalonica. Um, I can't remember where, but 
uh, he, he and uh, Barnabas were on their first missionary journey and they came to the city and they healed a man and they thought that he was uh, a god and so they were Zeus and so they were going to offer uh, sacrifices to him and then a few days later stoned him to death just for good measure. So Paul uh, again is mistaken for a god but these things were not unexpected. Mark 16 verses 17 and 18 talk about what would follow the, the gospel as it moved out from Jerusalem into the rest of the world. It says, And these signs will follow those who believe. In my name they will cast out demons, they will speak with many tongues, they will take up serpents, and if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. Personally, I believe that this is something that happened in, in the expansion of the, the gospel in the New Testament. I don't think we should be handling snakes today. Aren't you glad? Yeah. Yeah. That's why snakes, snake churches are small. <laughs> They're small for a reason. So uh, the Maltese natives drew the wrong conclusions about Paul's miraculous resistance to the poison, as they would. So in verse 7, it says, In that region there was an estate of a leading citizen of the island whose name was Publius who received us and entertained us courteously for three days. And it happened that the father Publius lay sick of a fever and dysentery. Paul went into him and prayed and laid his hands on him and healed him. You know, this was a death sentence in, in, in this time, New Testament time. I mean, you, if you had a fever and dysentery, you were going to die. And I, I can just imagine the, fa the, the Publius, whose father was sick, lying and just waiting to die, and yet he opened his home and his heart to these strangers, these people who had been shipwrecked, and brought them and hosted them in his, in his home. What, gen what a generous heart he had. And so as Paul gets to know Publius, and they're, they're, you know, they're getting to know each other, and finally it comes out that Publius' dad is, is sick and he's dying. And everybody else is sad, but Paul knows, right? Paul knows that this isn't the end. So Paul goes in and he, he heals Publius' father. And so Paul took advantage of this wonderful opportunity to minister to this needy person. But where, what was Paul's situation? He was a prisoner on his way to Rome. He was a prisoner on his, Rome, on his way to Rome, possibly to face a death sentence. Right? And... In the midst of all of the, the, you know, the storm and the shipwreck and all of these things and the fact that he's heading to Rome and he might die, uh, Paul takes advantage of the opportunity to minister to this needy person. And so in spite of his position as a prisoner, in spite of the fact that all this bad stuff was happening around him, he took time to minister to this person. And of course, in verse 9, uh, when you heal, it's, you hear that somebody's healing people, uh, if you're sick, you're going to look for that person. Especially back then when they had no medicine, no other way for healing. In verse 9 it says, so when this was done, the rest of those on the island who had diseases also came and were healed. And, and it's not a huge island, but everybody, everybody who had anything wrong with him flocked to Publius' uh, uh, estate. Did we look at Publius' estate? Garrett, should we look at Publius' estate? This is Publius' estate on the island of Malta. All right? All right we're going to keep going. So in verse 10, they also honored us in many ways, and when we departed, they provided such things as were necessary. So when Paul met the needs of one person, other needy people came looking for help. It's, it's like uh, when, when needy people find out that our church gives uh, money for people who are in need, you know, if a person says, I, I don't have gas for my car, and I've got to take my kid to the doctor, or uh, something like that, uh, we help them. And, and, and invariably, sometimes when that happens, we get a, a rush of requests for assistance because when you help one person, other needy people start, hey, we need help too, and, 
and so it's an opportunity to help many people. So in verse 11, we skip three months ahead. <laughs> this is pretty neat, right? Verse 11. Uh, they've been staying there with Publius on, on the, the island because it's winter and it isn't safe to go at sea, which is why they shouldn't have gone in the first place, right? I don't know how many I told you so's Paul got, got away with in that three-month period as they're twiddling their thumbs trying to figure out what to do. Well, I told you so. You probably said it over and over. In verse 11, it says, After three months we sailed in an Alexandrian ship. That's an Alexandrian from Egypt whose figurehead was the twin brothers, which had wintered at the island. Okay, and we've got a picture of that? I have a, I have a slide there. All right, so I'm, we're going to leave the slide up as I read this, okay, Gary? I'm going to direct this. So they, they're, they're on Malta. Um, from there, it says, we circled around, we uh, landed at, at Syracuse, and then we circled around and went to Regium, after one day the south wind blew, and the next day, next day we came to Hudeoli, which is up here, where we found brethren and were invited to stay with them seven days, and so went toward Rome. Now, it's interesting, I was doing research. You care about this? You don't care, but I care. It's interesting. Uh, one of the theories of why there were no snakes, you know, why there are no uh, poisonous snakes on Malta, is that this is not the right island. That this is uh, the wrong island. And Paul really was driven up into the Adriatic Sea all the way up to this little island in Croatia where there are poisonous snakes. Interesting. My problem with that is why in the world would they say, if they were going to Rome, why would they sail all the way back down the Adriatic Sea and land in Syracuse? And the point I want to make there is that you can't believe everything you read. The, these people who are making up these stories about the Bible and who are trying to disprove the Bible, trying to uh, discredit the Bible, uh, they're more than happy to make up stories that make absolutely no sense. The Bible, however, makes sense. Amen. Right? All right. Okay, you can go back to the Scriptures. Here, verse 15. And from there, we, uh, when the brethren had heard about us, they came to meet us as far as Epiphorum and the three inns. I've got another slide. Guess what this is? Three inns. Where, well, I don't think this is the three inns, but this is where the three inns was. This is the Appian Way, and it goes to Rome. It's the road to Rome. And it's where three roads come together, and there were three things there. There was a... a blacksmith's shop, a bar, and an inn. And so that's called the three inns, but it's, you don't care. It's interesting. <laughs> so, um, continuing on in verse uh, 15. When Paul saw them, he thanked God and took courage. You know, Paul's traveling, he's with all these non-Christians, soldiers, other prisoners, He's got a few of his friends with. Obviously, Luke is with him because he uses the word we, the guy who wrote this, the book of Acts. But Paul had never been to Rome before, right? We, we know that. He'd never been to Rome. And yet, as he's traveling on his way, the brethren, other Christians, hear about Paul and come and visit him at the three inns. And, and it's just amazing how God was able to raise up people Paul had no idea existed to come and, and encourage him as he was on his journey traveling to Rome. In verse 16 it says, Now when he came to Rome, the centurion delivered the prisoners to the captain of the guard, but Paul was permitted to dwell by himself for the soldier who guarded him. So Paul was encouraged by Christians on the road to Rome. Christians he didn't even know existed that got brought, in, got brought into his life for a reason. So what are you looking for? You know, if, if you and I are looking for uh, riches. If you and I are looking for love, if you and I are looking for success, if you and I are looking for uh, happiness, you know what we are? We're like those people with the cell phones wandering around Twin Lakes looking for, uh, what's the sparky one? 
Pikachu. Pikachu. Right? You're looking for Pikachu. It's, it's, I'm not yeah, saying that that isn't a fun game and you shouldn't play it, but we can we can be just looking for something that doesn't really exist by looking for all these other things. What should you, what should you and I be looking for? What are we looking for on this journey? I'm, I'm going to tell you what I'm looking for. I'm looking for the will of God. I don't know what that... Sometimes I don't know what that is. I'm looking for what He wants me to do today, where He wants me to go, who He wants me to talk to today. Because if I'm wasting my time looking for all of these other things, I'm not looking for the will of God. So as you search out God's will for your life, and I hope that you are searching out God's will for your life, there's some things that we need to remember okay, that will encourage us along the way. Paul was... Paul, did, do you think Paul knew what it was going to happen to him when he got to Rome? I don't think he really did. I think he suspected that he was going to get let go, but how could he really know unless God told him? And Paul ended up later on dying with his head being chopped off. So uh, that was the second time he appealed, uh, appeared before Caesar. So as we're journeying through our lives, as we're going about our business, trying to live the will of God, find the will of God, Sometimes God uses strangers to bless you with unexpected kindness along the way. Yep. Just a little note. That as you're traveling through, you're going to meet someone. I was, uh, we were talking, uh, I was talking to somebody this week, and he, this person got a new job, and, and they were saying how, you know, there's not a lot of Christians at this place. But there was this particular person, and she was, he could tell that she was, she was different, and talked about, asked her if she was a Christian, or he, she asked him, and yes, we're Christians, and they had this wonderful fellowship time of, of sharing what Christ was doing in their lives out of nowhere, and that happens to us, and we should expect it to happen to us. We shouldn't be surprised when it does. The second thing is that it is common for the unsaved to draw wrong conclusions about the miraculous evidences of God's presence in your life. You know how uh, they assume that, that uh, God... Uh, that Paul was a god, and that was why this good thing had happened to him. Uh, but uh, that's what non-Christians do. They don't get it. Right? They don't get that I'm a different person because of what God has done in my life. It's not because of some self-help therapy or uh, some uh, book that I read. It's because of what God has done and is doing in my life. And that transformation, sometimes they don't get it. They'll draw the wrong conclusions opportunity to share with them the right conclusion, which is that Jesus Christ is the reason for who I am. The third thing I want us to see is that we should take advantage of the opportunities God gives. You should take care of take advantage of the opportunity God gives you regardless of your disadvantages. You get what I'm saying? Have you ever been in a bad situation? None of you, right? You've never been in a bad situation, right? In those bad situ situations where we're struggling, when we're having some kind of uh, crisis, those are times God can use you to do something for Him that will speak to people. And that's what God did with Paul. And He can do the same thing through us. Now, I've been through some bad experiences, and, and the most I've ever been able to get out uh, uh, in some, some of the worst of times is just to pray. Praying for God to work. And trusting in God at, at that horrible moment of, of that thing that's happening. And that's a witness to the people. And, I know some people, have you ever heard about these people who uh, are they're dying of cancer in the hospital, right? And they're witnessing to everybody around them. They're sharing the gospel, their faith with nurses and doctors and, and fellow patients and all that. I, I don't know uh, what it takes to become that kind of person, <laughs> but uh, I hope that in that situation I would. But I know that there, for the rest of us who live on earth and not in heaven, uh, we have to... We have to think outside of ourselves, but not to the point where that if we don't do that, we're not living the, the life God wants for us. But we at least have to be trusting in Him in the midst of those situations as we go through them. And that testifies of God's work in our life. The fourth is that when God uses you to meet one person's needs, others often follow. <laughs> Amen? Amen? And then finally... God doesn't expect you to do this alone. 
You know, we're not islands. We need to be involved. We need to be a part of a body of believers. And we need to be willing to talk to people about Christ. And, and we need to be connecting with people outside of the church along the way. So the point I want to make is that if you make God's will your goal in life, you will never be without a purpose, and you will never be alone. Amen. 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 Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that you are uh, the God who has a purpose for our lives and that we can have confidence in the fact that you are going to be working, that you have a will for us, that you're going to reveal your will to us as we seek it out and we obey you and follow you. Lord, I pray that you would uh, be with each person here today, Lord, whatever their situation, if they're looking for your will, that you would direct them to it, that they would find confidence in knowing that you have a will for their life. And Lord, I pray for people who have two choices, that you would give them um, wisdom about which is the one that you would have them to do. And, and we just know that you are in control and that you love us and that you want us to be able to find out what your will is, Lord. So help us to do that. And as we do that, help us to continue to follow you each and every day of our lives.